Thanks, everyone. It's, it's really great to be back here. Um, this is like my favorite place to come to because it's the university that I wish I went to if it existed when I was going to school. Um, so my, my background, industrial design. Industrial design is, is bound at the hip with mass production. That's the two are married. Um, it does a lot of good things. The, a quick history of it. You look back in time, things didn't used to be mass produced, obviously. They were made one thing per person by a, a skilled artisan. And so each artifact that came from that was unique to that person and it was an, an individualized instantiation. You know, of course, that gave way to mass production. And a lot of benefits came from that. All of a sudden, instead of these things being untested, because you can't test individualized instantiations, you had things that were testable. And you, you had things that were reliable and predictable. And all of a sudden, you had cheap. Because if you're making a zillion of something, you can amortize the cost of that zillion things over all the, uh, the, the upfront cost gets split over all the purchasers. So you get all these great benefits that come from that. But um, here's, here's some of the stuff I've done, Apple and who, PDAs and Silicon Graphics and Palm and all these guys. And this is the kind of stuff they do. It's like, um, there's more Apple stuff, I guess. That um, it allows everybody to get cheap and, and pretty good. The downside, though, is that there, there, you know, it comes at a price. And so, has anyone seen Fight Club? This is that scene where Ed Norton kind of <clears throat> wakes up and looks around and realizes that his life is just concoction of crap that he bought at IKEA, and that it wasn't all that different from anyone else who bought other crap at IKEA because everybody just bought the same crap at IKEA. And he has this existential crisis and blows up Los Angeles. And you know, be that good or bad, that's not my call to make, but. Um, that's Northern California perspective, by the way. Um, so instead of you know, blowing up Los Angeles, bad. Um, here's another pitfall of mass production, is that if you have things that are just inherently individualized by nature, it doesn't work. So you have you know, horrible crap like this coming out, where you know, somebody loses a leg, the one thing they don't need is this weird amalgam of parts that are some bit mass produced and some bit, you know, what's that foot doing there? You know, that, doesn't belong, and then this socket that was custom made, and all of it just looks like this garage sale of dissimilar parts that are just offensive more than anything to the, the user. And paradoxically, this is the most important thing in that person's life when they have to start using this or, or when it becomes part of their existence. And so here's the most important thing is also the crappiest thing they've ever seen. You know, what a you know, double level of misery that is. So to address that, um, you, you kind of have to just say, okay, Let's, let's skip out on mass production, change all the rules, and kind of rethink all this stuff. So that's what brings me here, and that's what, where I think things get exciting, is when you get rid of all the traditional rules and start over. So I set out to, to uh, kind of figure out a better way to do this. I was teaching at Carnegie Mellon a couple years ago and spent, I guess, three years since then working on this kind of stuff. Um, found it's like kind of the cocktail of three-dimensional scanning, parametric modeling, and three-dimensional printing, basically how you get something from the outside world into the computer, how to manipulate it once it's there, and then how to spit it out into something usable again. So here's the quick, quick overview of what all those are and, and what they can do. 3D scanning, it is what it is. You know, it's what it sounds like. You can, it's as easy to do as holding a can of spray paint. You swipe it down, lasers go out, pick up everything in front of it, and as long as you're essentially thinking you're spray painting something, it's all going into the computer in a nice 3D shape. Um, that scanner there is about $40,000. They range 40 to 60. Um, here I'm using a different type of scanner to scan an amputee's uh, surviving leg, sound side leg. Here is, this is over $100,000, extremely accurate. So you get these really super high-end scanners that can do all kinds of great things. But you can also go budget and you can stick two cameras together and get some shareware and you can do a process called stereo photogrammetry. It's what your eyes do. They do a lot of triangulation, a lot of trig and you can generate a three-dimensional shape that way. Um, it's also called image correlation. Um, or you can go to the hardware store and get a laser level, harvest out the laser, wash it all over the thing, get, the, get a, a webcam, some freeware. This is called David, if you're interested. It's called the David scanner. It's all do-it-yourself stuff. Um, and you can, you can generate a decent scan this way. What gets scanned? Um, some big stuff. You know, Philadelphia is getting scanned. Amsterdam is getting scanned. The country of Sweden is getting scanned. Um, so you know, that's big scale scanning. Um, architectural remnants. You know, that's, if something's going to be blown up or go away, scan it first and you know, preserve it as best you can. 
Um, I do all body related stuff, so that's, I, I've got all my body parts digitized in one form or another. Um, that is what I can show. Here's, um, this is all, this was done with a laser scanner, the kind they do, um, this is done down in Hollywood where they do a lot of that stuff. All the actors you see get scanned for different reasons. Um, some that are actually really entertaining. But this is, one of the things you see is that my brown hair won't scan. So I have to wear a white stocking cap and, and put uh, white powder on my eyebrows in order to scan because it's laser, it's contrast based and the, the dark hair wouldn't work and also the noise of hair doesn't work. So it has limitations. There's, there's me with a vanity polygon. Um, this, yeah. Um, but yeah, so one of the things you notice is that there's no color in this. This is just pure lasers going out, data coming back, three-dimensional models constructed. Um, here's some, I was doing some work with Discovery Channel I'll go into. We scanned the hosts for the show and then they were getting silly afterwards and oh, look what happens when you get silly in front of a scanner, you make your body do funny things. Um, but then you can also do, there's, there are different types of scanning and some that are image-based. And so you, you, it's, it's capturing the image as well as the geometry, you map the two together, and you can get an extremely accurate, lifelike representation. Again, cheap, freeware. You know, you can do this for, if you have the energy, you can do it for, uh, for cheap to nothing. Um, you know, Avatar, this, you see this in Hollywood all the time. You see it everywhere, you just don't necessarily know that this is what's going on. But the interesting thing is that once you have the data and it's 3D, you can do anything you want with it. It's yours, you know, play with it, stretch it, tweak it, you know, make art out of it, anything you want. It's, you know, it's a very flexible thing once it's in the computer. So, okay, putting that on hold, now we get to parametrics. The whole thing is if you're gonna change the world, if you're gonna do anything big, it has to be scalable. Um, that's one of the big challenges is that you can't treat anything as one-offs. You can't, do, you know, you have to make it so the computer does all the work. Um, that's another way to think of parametrics is it's just offloading all your labor to the computer so that it does your work for you. Um, easy example, this is one shape, modified one parameter and all the other parameters change and all of a sudden you have a very different shape that results. That's, that's the, the quick overview. This is what I gave to my course at Stanford. Um, first day is we said, okay, here's a wine glass. Um, give it different attributes verbally that change the physical characteristics of it mathematically and geometrically. So in this case, wine glass, one piece of geometry, you can increase the cognacness of it. You know, in an Excel spreadsheet, I want point, you know, 70 percent cognac, and it goes into that one in the upper left corner. You have more cognac, or you have a champagne glassness factor, and you can scale that to 0.9, and you get wherever. So it basically takes something verbal and turns it into something physical and geometric. So that's that's one way of doing it, and it creates entirely new instantiations each time. Here's uh, Eames chair we took, and we said, okay. Um, let's take personality traits. So we have type A and type A, type B uh, personalities that have it. And so you have it, you can scale it. So you have like your, your relaxed type B person chilling out there and you have the uptight type A person up in the other corner. And then we had the, uh, I think we had like the Houston, Texas, anyone from Houston is gonna be pissed at this. We had the Houston, Texas parameter, which is, that gets you down to the bottom right corner. So it just, as you scale up your Houstonness, it just gets wider. <laughs> and then it, it, we had the, what was it? Uh, Phoenix, arizona -ness, which is, it adds more ventilation. So the hotter it gets, the more ventilation. So it's, it essentially just turns your, your uh, verbal thing into a geometric thing, and it creates in individual instantiations. The interesting thing, though, is the computer does all the work, and you create, essentially, as many instantiations as you could dream up. You know, theoretically infinite. Here is, if you apply it towards something fairly practical, you take a house this way, and you can, you can build logic into these parameters, so that it has all of your earthquake, per your, your seismic, your thermal codes, every other code you can imagine, it's backing up all the parameters that govern the geometry. So now the user is just let to cut loose and drag walls and pull windows and doors wherever they want, but it won't let them violate something that's going to uh, kill their seismic or thermal. So in this case, quick, we set this up, we gave it to the students, they started shaping houses and making all kinds of variations, each one entirely diff different from the next but um, all of them following within codes, which is the, the thing, you know, you have earthquakes and houses fall down if they aren't up to code, or you have seismic um, less than optimization and people have to deforest around them to heat their homes. Well, this is, this is a challenge to that. Here was the model that we did. We started with a, the home in the upper corner and you just stretch and pull and push and pull, and you get rooms and you can change terrains, and we had a snow load that makes the roof more pitched and we had an overhang 
that is reactive to where it is on the equatorial belt and the ambient temperature, things like that. All that stuff can just be built in the parameters, so the person's not designing. The person isn't expected to be an architect. They just know what their intent is, and they just push their intent around, and the computer gives them all the assistance as though they are sitting with an architect right behind them. So now you got 3D scanning getting into the computer, tweaking it around, doing it automatically so that you don't have a skilled professional needed to do everything you do. Now you have to spit it out and make something useful out of it, and this is where things get fun. Digital fabrication, you can call it absolutely anything because it, it's in a semantic nightmare here. Um, here. These are all the names that I could come up with in five minutes for it, but it has a lot more. Um, it's, you know, it's an engineering tool, so nobody knows what to call it. Um, but basically what it is, it's an additive process, as you guys have seen with the MakerBot and uh, stuff you have back here. It's additive, that's the main difference, is that you're assembling molecules either by layer or by dust particle or by liquid that's being sintered or liquid being deposited. You're doing that layer by layer by layer. You do it enough times and you get a pretty good facsimile of what you originally intended. So that's a typical machine. This is a liquid-based machine. If you're going to be designing car wheels, it'd be really hard to machine each one out of a block of plastic and get the likeness. Better to just do your design, send it out to print, come back the next day, pull it out of the oven, and ready to go. That's, you know, that's the kind of efficiencies you get out of it. The machines are, can be really expensive, like this one and the other, the previous one, which were on $800,000. Eight to 900, they're pricey bastards. Or you get the cheap stuff. You know, these are in the like $3,000 and below. And you know, build them yourself, this one will self-replicate. Um, you've got MakerBot, um, there are food bots, there's all kinds of stuff you can do in the low end. The low end's getting more exciting by the day. The exciting thing about the whole situation though is that complexity is free when you're doing additive fabrication. And that takes a while to get your head around because we're not used to that. You know, if, it'd be like going to the Mercedes dealer and saying, you know, the guy says, well, do you want the car with no options or do you want the E-Class with every option? You say, well, what's the price delta? And they say, oh, they're the same. It's like, well, I'll do the E-class then. You know, it's, it's a, we, we just aren't conditioned to think of complexity costing the same as non-complexity. It's, it's normally this gradient. Cost or complexity detail has cost with it. Well, we don't have that. So now, here's some examples of what happens when you throw complexity out the window as being a, a cost inhibitor. Um, jewelry has really gotten excited by this. So now you can download Rhino Jewel and create your own jewelry. Um, you can make all kinds of things. This is a really, really high definition printer. They do this for lost wax casting. You can make one of those things, whatever it is. You know, anything you want. You can make it, send it out, print it. You can get it in gold and polish it up and you've got your whatever that is. Um, you know, this is like Liberace's ring here waiting to happen. And, you know, you can do all this. It, it makes it really fancy. You don't have to be a skilled artisan necessarily to make jewelry or a ring, you can essentially do it yourself, print it, make it happen. Um, same kind of thing. It would be very hard to make these other ways. So making really crazy complex geometry, normally subtractively that would be really difficult because you have to machine it with some kind of router or CNC computer controlled milling machine. With this technology you don't have that problem. You just design it, throw it out there, it prints whatever you tell it to. It doesn't care if it's printing something fancy or something simple, it just prints. So you get shapes that you've never imagined before, you couldn't see before, and now suddenly you're kind of being challenged, if anything, to see if you can be as creative as the tool lets you be, because it can do far more than your brain could ever handle. That's, that's what I think is really exciting about it, is that it really doesn't have limits to it. Um, just talking about metals, you know, it's, that's one of the new exciting things. Metals used to be a, a real pain, now they're getting good. Um, turbine blades, you know, things that are really difficult to machine or make any other way. You can make really high definition, really high quality metal parts now. Um, I have actually some of these. I'll just pass these around, these are kind of fun. The fun thing with these is if you've seen the, if you've seen 3D printing of any kind, you know that it has a granularity or a, a layerness to it. These don't, you know, that's how high the resolution is. It's, it's super, super high resolution, very fine printing. Um, again, it invites really complex geometry. Stuff that you've never seen before, and now all of a sudden you can hold it in your hand and touch it. It really invites the artist to go to town. Um, architects, so, you know, so if you're an architect and you come up with a shape, ultimately you have to have some kind of physical embodiment for people to gather around and make some decisions on. But if you're a Zephyrotark and you're doing some really elaborate geometry, you know, you're not going to make that with an X-Acto knife and a bunch of paper and some balsa wood and you know, glue it together. It's just that's super weird 
geometry that only Zephyrotark knows how to make. So, you know, how are you going to make that traditionally? You know, you can't, you can't tape and glue that together. It doesn't work. So they 3D print it. They've already got the file digital from the beginning. Might as well just send it out to the printer, and you get your form, and everybody can gather around it that way. So it's a visualization tool. It's the architect's dream tool. Um, Iowa Moto Scott, they're a group up in um, San Francisco. They do these beautiful, complex structures, Voronoi cells, and, and uh, structures that are derived from nature and natural forms. You, again, geometry way too complex to model any other way. So they just print it. Overnight, all comes out the same. More shapes, great complex modern shapes, that kind of stuff. It's like, yeah, you better 3D print it. There really is no other way to instantiate it. Um, the arts, you know, it, the people who are sculptors and artists, the whole point of the arts is, is really to challenge you to think in different ways, to make you see things in a different light, to, to really fire up your imagination. Well, here's, um, here's what you can do when you can 3D scan things, you know, motion capture and 3D print. You can, things that you could only have imagined before, you know, what motion actually looks like. Well, you can kind of see it, but if you can actually walk around it and touch it and, and understand the contours and the shapes, it gives you a very different insight into what the motion is. This is one of my favorites. This is uh, an artist in Scotland. He actually did mocap, uh, motion capture on a moth spinning around a candle and 3D printed the geometric form that came out of the path of the wings beating and the volume displaced by the wings in the body as it flipped around this candle. And then he 3D printed it. And that, I think you can buy, but that's a, uh, a uh, lamp diffuser. So you, get, you put a light bulb in it, and now you've got your diffuser, which is made from a moth flying around it. It's interesting from a lot of perspectives. One is it's unmakeable before, but now you can actually kind of peer into the, the mindset of a moth, because you can see what it's doing and how it's reacting and thinking as it's spinning around this flame. What's also really cool about it from the designer perspective is there was never a designer sitting down with a pencil and paper and a ruler and a drafting board saying, this is the shape I'm going to make. You know, the designer had no idea. The real designer is a moth, and it's dead by now. You know, it's, it's, it was the designer set up some preconditions, and the moth did the rest. You know, that's, that's new and weird and different. It um, kind of gets to you know, this level of, I think, this level of intrigue where we start noticing that yeah, we've seen this before. When people start understanding motion and some of these physical principles in a better level, it, it really changes everything. Some artists working on jewelry, again, really conceptual stuff. It'd be very hard to do this other ways. Um, shapes that are just beautiful and weird. Uh, the shape on the left is Bathsheba Grossman. She's in Santa Cruz, mathematician. She comes up with these crazy complex, beautiful shapes and 3D prints everything. And it's, it's all on her site, bathsheba.com, if you want to buy any of this stuff. It's, it's just beautiful, amazing stuff, and it's not even terribly pricey. Um, this is a lamp. Yes, it glows. It's very surreal. Very cool. Again, it's for sale. Unique lamps. Lamps are always where you find the coolest high tech. Um, you know, every, every one is going to be different because it's based on your thumbprint. You know, it's, they're inherently different. So you know, your thing is not something you get onto IKEA and get. It's, it's as unique, literally, as your fingerprint. Um, medical stuff. Um, I have plan before you cut. You know, what a cool thing is, OK, if you come in and you've got a really, you've fallen off your hoppity horse and you've destroyed your shoulder, and, and they have to figure out, OK, you've got bone fragments all over the place. They have to strategize before they go in and, and have you under, the, under, under gas. So well, they can actually do MRI, get your bone structure, MRI or CT, one of those, get your bone structure, get the DICOM data, three-dimensionally print the whole thing, and then strategize on it before they open you up. So they know where all the parts are, and they know what part's going to come out and which are going to get rearranged in which way. That's a really cool new thing. Um, if you go into the hospital with a chunk of your head missing, like those other two skull chunks, well, they can, they can get the data of the geometry of your skull, extrapolate the contours off of it, and then 3D print out of titanium or uh, cobalt chromium or 17-4, um, a trabecular structure, a, a porous kind of uh, Brillo pad-like structure, drop it in place, it will be a perfect fit because it was designed off of your own geometry to start with. And then your bones will grow through it just like vines on a trellis and pretty soon you've got your parts back. Um, teeth, dental industry loves this because it's super high precision. Um, and each tooth is unique. You can't mass produce teeth. You know, perfect application for this kind of stuff. Biomimicry. Um, this is it's a, a hot topic that's kind of been evolving along at the same pace as 3D printing and all this stuff. Biomimicry is a really wild new idea. It's basically saying, hey, let nature do all your design for you. 
um, ask nature when you run into challenges. I, interestingly enough, that even though that sounds very Marin County and, and you know granola-like, it's um, the military is the biggest researcher of biomimicry because they're saying, hey, animals are always in a survival fight. Let's find out how they do it. Um, but artists are doing a lot of stuff with it as well. This is we're looking at the, some of the trabecular structures here, or, or not trabecular, sorry, this is uh, bronchial bifurcations and fractals, looking at how some of these structures can be turned into art in this case. Um, generative design, which is another area which is, is really doing some interesting stuff with uh, Autodesk, where instead of you designing it, you tell the computer, the, the geometric scripting, what you want at the end of the day, and it creates all your geometry for you, just like nature does. It creates the optimum structural situation. Um, termite mound. This was taken from slicing up a termite mound and building a 3D computer model, very, very big computer model, and then 3D printing it, so you can better understand how termite mounds maintain their homeostasis. Um, it's a very complex thing. We haven't been able to really do too well on that front. Artists looking at the biology of cell structures and Voronoi structures to make jewelry, cells. Um, some really beautiful shapes like this, derived from just the beauty that you find in nature, and then interpreted into other things, into jewelry and such. Um, this is one of my favorites. This is Marcel Wanders out of Amsterdam. Um, he managed to digitally capture a sneeze. So this is the flying tumble. That's like sinusitis and pollenitis are the names of those two bases. Um, and so they digitized that tumbling, flying sneeze. It's not. And then they surfaced it, 3D, blew it up. I mean, physically blew it up size-wise, and then 3D printed it. And you can buy that at the Museum of Modern Art for about <laughs> three or four hundred bucks. So it's like, you know, how cool is that that you can? A guy came up with a way to make you buy snot for 300 bucks at the Museum of Modern Art. That, it's like, that's just, I think that's insanely cool. Um, so the other thing that's interesting, when you are printing your product on demand, you change the business model as well. And that's where things get interesting for everybody with an MBA here. Um, Shapeways, check it, write that down, everybody's got a pen. Shapeways is a really cool site. If you want to make a, get a part printed, you just you make your STL file, which is just a three-dimensional file, it's polygonized, upload it to Shapeways, set up an account, and they'll send it to you in 10 days. And you choose if you want it to be stainless steel or you know, plastic or glass. You can three-dimensionally print glass. Um, anything you want, they'll send it to you in 10 days. So what that does, though, is let's say I, I make this really cool ring. This was actually 3D printed. Load that up to Shapeways. and. A lot of people like it. Well, Shapeway sends me a dollar for every one that gets downloaded and printed. They take the difference. Everybody gets the ring. So now I can create a marketplace and leave it on Shapeways. And just by, just by uploading my designs, here's a typical thing. This cost $4.64. You know, all automated process, and they have thousands of really cool things. So for Grins, I made a Singularity logo, and they, well, Singularity ring. They put it upside down, so imagine this is the way it should be. Um, but it looks like, see if that works, yes. So here's this class's ring, Singularity 2010. It's for a 19 millimeter ring, but we can make more if people like it. Um, so that is the ring that's been uploaded now. Thank you. We'll find out in about 10 days if it works as a bottle opener or not. I think it will, but you know, that's, that's the coup. And it, it wasn't, there we go. So if you want one of these in 19 millimeters, you can get it by downloading it off their site. And I think, it, what does it cost? Uh, $2.82 in plastic, and they say $8 in stainless steel. And then you can buff it. You know, it's not gonna break anyone's bank. Um, and it's a cool stainless steel ring. And I get like a dollar or something every time you guys buy one. So everyone get shitloads of them. <laughs> and then we're good. So, but it's an interesting new market. You know, it's a, it's a totally different thing from traditional. I'm not taking any risk by making this. So I might as well make it, get myself one. And if it is a hit, great. Everybody gets happy. So that's Shapeways. Here's a, a different company that's kind of capitalizing on the same basic idea of print on demand. Uh, they're called a freedom of creation. If you have money to burn and you've got a really cool house, these guys have the cool lamp that you want. Um, the interesting thing about their business model, though, is that they don't have any inventory. And they had no upfront cost. It was a bunch of college grads, and they came up with their, you know, after school, they're in their dorm room. They came up with these ideas, hey, we can make these lamps, and we have zero upfront cost. If you were going to make 30 lamps 
they have, that are like that level of complexity. Your tooling cost is going to be in the millions, and your risk is going to be sky high, because if nobody buys them, you're out millions of dollars. So there's no way you would take that kind of chance. So risk has a cost associated. But if you're 3D printing something on demand, there's no risk. So why not? That's where things, I think, get really interesting, is it invites adventure. It invites you to come up with something interesting, because there's no there's no downside to it. You know, there's only a chance that it'll be a hit, and then everybody's happy. So these cost, you know, three to four hundred bucks. They're they're pricey, but there's no inventory. You get it, they send it to you, and they're really really cool. So that's kind of the background. Um, I have two kind of case studies to go through. I was uh, brought on to uh, Discovery Channel. Had a show. Did anyone see the Discovery Channel show called Prototype This? <laughs> wow, that's why they never made it to second season. Okay, one. That is about what they said that the ratings were, yeah. No, okay, it was a crap show, but did you see the show I was on? The firefighter's suit? No? Was it really memorable? Wow. I worked really hard. I worked like eight weeks on that. But, um, so, yeah, that's what, well, it's Discovery Channel. So, uh, we, we took the premise of we're going to create the suit of armor for the firefighter of the future. So we looked into, it was, you know, bear with me, it's TV. Um, so we looked at what a firefighter has. Well, they have this crap that they put on their back. They all have spine problems because they're, they're carrying this crap around that's not really made for their back. It's not comfortable or form-fitting. And they have to use it in extreme situations. It's like a perfect combination to see a chiropractor. So they have this crap. We decided, okay, the future firefighter is not going to have that crap. It's going to have something really cool and slipstream and fluid and, and body conforming. And so we did a bunch of designs like this. Said, okay, it's going gonna, it's gonna, to be part of the body. It's going to be kind of the symbiote that you wear instead of something that hangs on your shoulders. Because they have a, it's like 100 pounds of stuff they have to take upstairs and stuff. So we did a bunch of designs, came up with all these cool patterns, things like that, and figured, okay, we have to make it wrap around the arm like a suit of armor. And also they can deflect things, which we found out that firefighters never do, but it seemed cool. And then also we figured, okay, we'll run a hose down it, because you can print a hose right into it and print it hollow. And then you can shoot fire out like Spider-Man, just and so we just thought that would be good on TV, and it was. Um, so we started with a 3D scan of the, the bodies. We got all the hosts to go down to LA, and we did this 3D body scan of them. And that was kind of fun, because you got to see who's got the, like, the beer gut. And you know, they're like underwear lines and all this stuff. And it looked really stupid on TV, but that's why they didn't make second season. So, um, so then I took the, the body models and harvested some of the geometry around their lumbar and their, their, um, their thoracic. And, turn that into the geometry of the backpack so that some of that geometry is fixed, like the tank and plumbing and things like that, electronics. And then some of it is individualized, that every person gets different geometry. You pull it out and drop it in. And so then we th that's what it looked like. Um, we did the same with the arm. Took the arm, offset it for the fabric thickness, thickened it, put the tube running down the back of it there, put the hinge so it's actually printed in. Of course, you can do that with 3D printing. And then printed it. And that's, that's a shot, and then we sanded it and painted it after, and so it, it looked really trick. Um, but you can see how the contours on the back there, the biomorphic parts, those are just harvested right off the person's geometry. So it was a perfect, flawless fit. It fit the person like a second skin, and, they, and it distributed the weight so well that he wasn't even aware that he had 100 pounds on his pack. And there you can see the inside contours of how it, how it climbs down his thoracic, and the arm piece there, and the hose, all that stuff. Um, we also printed stainless steel for the eyepiece and all kinds of fancy stuff. Um, so then we had the final payoff, the last minutes of the show. The guy put out a spot fire by pulling it, and, and a dry cam went shooting out his arm, and that, that was really cool. Um, okay, so that's, that's that. The, real, the stuff that I do a lot more work on is, is more substantial. Is the idea of saying, okay, if, if, again, back to the amputee thing, if you're going to lose your limb and you're going to get something that looks like a vacuum cleaner to replace it, you know, it's kind of, I just see that as insult to injury. It's like a, a job halfway done. They got halfway there and they said, okay, screw it, we're done. And th that just seems like, okay, who dropped the ball? Why, why does somebody have to endure that? Well, it's, it's a really hard task to get all the things you want, to make something that actually complements the body or, or pays homage or respect to the person at all. So set out to do that. This is John here. Um, that's his real name, actually. And so that's, that's the difference. You know, the, the idea is saying, first thing you want to restore is the person's symmetry. You know, symmetry has a lot to do with just our sense of well-being. That the more asymmetric, that's kind of your announcement to the world that something's really wrong. So just symmetry is just a natural thing. It, it lets somebody feel a little more comfortable. 
So there's John in a, in a 3D body scan. There's a parametric model. So this model can take any human, you drop it in, you say, okay, reinstantiate. There's John's sound side leg mirrored over, dropped into the parametric model before instantiating. And there's the new leg. It's ready to go. Um, here's another shot of it. You get a couple of dividends from this. It's theft proof, you know, which is weird because, yeah, imagine some parts of the world. If you've got a really good leg, it's, it's a liability. Somebody's going to want it because there's somebody else who's going to want it. Um, this is theft proof because it is your geometry. It's based on you. Um, this is actually this leg here. Oh, wouldn't that be cool if it could stand on its own? Nope. Okay. So this is this leg. Um, it gives, again, it gives them a sense of symmetry back. You know, it's kind of a big deal. It has a seven bar linkage, so the motion of the knee is, is perfectly calibrated to a human motion. It moves through the same motion that we do. The foot is sprung just like our own ankle. The gastrocnemius here, the calf muscle, that's sprung according to the person's weight and activity level. So that will give spring back with each step. Um, these are things you won't get in a $70,000 leg if you, if you need to get it. Um, but this whole print costs about $5,000. You know, it's something that, um, because you're printing all pieces at once, you don't have the titanium mounting parts and all the other details. You just print the whole thing, complexity and all. It's hollow, so there's a rib structure inside just like a bird wing. That keeps it really strong and really light simultaneously. So that one was <coughs> aimed at, at um, the developing world. Again, here's 3D scan, body symmetry. You can do a tattoo down the back, anything you like there. Again, complexity is free. So there's this cross section of the knee. There's a lot of mechanism going on inside that knee to make it work. There's John wearing it. He walked around in LA for a while in this, and people were looking at it, and they were really psyched. You know, people were jealous. And he was saying, well, nobody's ever been jealous of my leg before. You know? He, you know, it just, when, the, when the wind blew, just the basic respect of somebody's pants wrapping around their shape, there's something to that, you know, something that he hasn't had in a long, long time. So there, there was just that little value add. This is kind of the only way you're going to get there, is with all these digital processes. Here's another guy. This is Mike. He um, was run over by a water ski boat about 100 yards off this dock up in Tahoe. And so again, 3D print, 3D scan. And same thing, Mike gets to have his shape back. He gets to put on two shoes that are the same size, you know, little details like that. When he pulls up his socks, wears long pants, nobody knows because the shape is perfectly symmetric. We're working on some later generations that are gonna have really cool tattoos and patterns, wrapped in leather, cool mechanism designs. This is, this is some of his own doing. Here's another leg we did for him. And this is wrapped in leather and actually looks really cool. And then we did a cool tattoo running down the back of his calf because that's just the kind of guy Mike is. And there's Mike just sitting on the dock. So this is stuff, again, you know, it's about just returning a, a sense of self to the person, you know, a sense of wholeness, a sense of kind of the person's actually back to their original shape, at least to some degree. It's not pretending to be human tissue, that's gone, and they're, he's fine with that. It's coming up with something that still pays respect to his shape, gives him his form. So this is this leg up here. This is back to John again. We decide, okay, let's, let's you know, kick out all the jams and, and make it really, really trick. You know, he's in LA, so that's, you know, has to be shiny. Um, but again, 3D printed. This is just coated uh, with a thin layer of metal. And, and it looks cool. His girlfriend came down when we were walking around. She said, wow, I want one. And he said, well, you can't have one. She, well, it's like the, you know, the barrier to entry is really tough when you're talking about this. Um, but he's psyched about this. You know? And there's, there's something to be said about just being able to make somebody psyched about the next day, about waking up in the morning, seeing this sitting next to the bed stand and going, wow, cool. You know, I get to wear that. That's a, it's a very different perspective than he's always had. Um, one of the things I should say about this leg, too, um, dishwasher safe. You know, it sounds, it sounds weird. But that is fully dishwasher safe. I discovered that. I was curious, so I tested it. Um, and then I had a date that night and made dinner. And so we were cleaning up after. And my girlfriend like, opened the dishwasher. And <laughs> like, holy shit. And you know, that's a trial by fire. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's completely dishwasher. You know, and if you're going to make a body part, yeah, make it cleanable. You know, you'd be surprised. If you can't wash something, it gets nasty fast. But this, throw it in the dishwasher, it's all good to go. Um, as far as getting green points goes, 
it's as green as it gets. This was a 140 watt laser running for 30 hours. That's nothing. You know, that's your dishwasher running twice, it's your garage door opener going twice, you know, it's an escalator going for you know, five minutes, something like that. It's just trivial environmental cost. And then when it's done, it's all curbside recyclable. It's all one material, you throw it out, it has a number seven on the back, and it becomes industrial carpet. So you get points kind of all the way around with this kind of stuff. So there's John. One of the other things is we said, okay, well, we can make different fairing panels, just like on a motorcycle. So if you want to change, you just swap out one for the next. You can kind of change your personality throughout the course of the day. You know, try doing that with any other type of body part. So here's something, if, if Discovery Channel had gone into season two, we were about to do this, but they didn't. Um, we're deciding, okay, let's, let's do a better wheelchair. You know, for the quadriplegic athlete. So we said, okay, it's gonna, it's gonna lie prone. He's gonna have banks of wheels on his forearms, just like a rollerblader, and he can push off and skate. And then there's a motorized wheel on the back to help him go up hills. And so we had all the CAD designs. We were finding people. Um, but yeah, but it died mid-season. Um, but again, this is one of those things that you could never do traditional ways. For one thing, your market isn't big enough. You know, how many, you know, how many units are you gonna sell? Well, not enough to ever amortize your upfront costs, so it would be sky high. And it has to be entirely individualized because you have to wear it like an exoskeleton. So you can't do that with traditional manufacturing that you adjust to size, it's just not gonna work. So this is kind of, again, the only technology that if you were gonna get to that level, this is the only way you're gonna get there. So again, this is kind of, it's a type of technology that just allows a whole different way of thinking and hopefully a whole different type of solution for people who have, who have real needs. So thanks for your time, I hope you found it really interesting. Time for. Which materials can you use? There's plastic and metal. There's plastics, metals, ceramic, glass, all kinds of polymers, um, ABS type, PVC type. Um, uh, this is polyamid type. There are maybe 20 types of polyamids, carbon filled, fire retardants, Do almost. Bio they're biopolymers. Um, the guy to talk to is Andrew Hessel. And he is part of the faculty here at Singularity. He knows about that stuff. I don't know about bio stuff. But yes, there's a ton of work going on in biopolymers and all that collagen scaffolding and all that stuff. It's wild stuff. That's, that's a huge area that's happening. And can you print uh, different materials in the same? Uh... There's only one machine that'll do that. It is the Object Eden machine, I think, that will do multiple materials simultaneously. Typically, metals are in their own world. Polyamides are in their own world. There's one machine that'll do a handful. It'll do like polymers and elastomers and colors. Uh, it won't do different classes like metals. That, everybody's waiting for that day. You know, that day comes when you can just print anything you dream up and things will be exciting then. Yeah. Ceramics. And is the process essentially the yes. same for all these materials? Is it just heated locally at the tip and then it's screwed? Or is it, are they different? Materials? They're actually different for each material. Um, po yeah, polyamides and metals are done with an electron beam or a laser, uh, CO2 laser typically. And they will cross, they'll trace out the cross section and that'll center a layer of dust onto the layer below it, and they just do that sequentially until you have a zillion of them. This is a, a crappy proto, but it does show the layer lines. So you can see the, the stair-stepping that happens. Um, there are deposition modelers like you have here, which actually are just like a, a cake batter squeezer thing on an XY plotter. Um, there are, what else, those are the three, and there's liquid-based. And liquid-based, um, it's a CO2 laser ultraviolet that hits a photopolymer that cures when it gets hit with a photopolymer laser. Uh -huh. um, the 3D scanning of the two cameras mm -hmm. seems like a pretty cool idea. Do you have any um, application examples of that? Um, like here with me or? Or no, like uh, what people did with that. Y yeah, there's all kinds of stuff that uh, the thing to look at is a company called Photomodeler. And yeah, Photomodeler Scanner is their main software. And it allows you to take two cameras that are calibrated. You want a, a Canon a Rebel EOS camera and you fire them off at the same time, and it will do the triangulation and create a 3D shape. What is the reason for getting the more cheaper of these 3D printers? What's, sorry? The minimum of cutting the cost of buying one. Yeah, the sad thing is there. No, no, the reason is also exponential, I believe it is good. Well, it's actually, it's not following Moore's law, unfortunately. This is, you know, everything else in technology is following yeah. Moore's law, not this. So, yeah. sorry? Or it's, yeah, it's, they're not getting cheap fast, unfortunately. The materials are expensive, 
Um, the process of the machines are expensive. They're not coming down anytime soon. The exciting stuff has happened. The big fancy $800,000 machines were $800,000 two years ago. The cool stuff though is that the little machines, like the, the Platypus, the MakerBot, the, the low end machines are getting better. And I think that's where. Of. Oh, three oh, oh uh, those are you know under three thousand, you know three to five thousand. Um, Hewlett Packard is going to be OEMing uh, the Dimension printer. That'll be exciting because then it's going to be more commodity and more you know invited to more people. Um, there's rumors that Japan, China, and India are making machines that are going to hit the U.S. market eventually. That may drive the cost down. Um, there are new technologies on the horizon. The problem is there just aren't enough applications that are demanding the stuff, so the markets are not happening at any Moore's law, unfortunately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I was just curious about the durability and strength of the metals after they're printed as compared to just you know, other manufacturing techniques. Yeah, the metals are, are incredibly strong. Um, they're almost entirely, well, they're not entirely dense out of the process, but you can hit it with something called HIP, which stands for hot isostatic pressure, where they heat it to its near melt point and a zillion PSI, and that will knock out any errant molecules, and then it's like 99.9% .9 solid and dense. So if you're doing like medical stuff like knees and hips, then you hit it with a hip process and then it's as strong as anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the largest you can do with that? Um, yeah. Professor Kushnevis will be able to answer that better. The, the machines, of a, a typical machines like this one, um, have a build envelope of 30 inches by 20 inches by 20 inches, uh, vertical and horizontal depending on which machine. There are, there's a, one machine in Belgium called the Mammoth Machine that will do two meters, and two meters by one meter by 20 inches or something. So there, there are big machines like that. There isn't a lot of demand for big yet. Um, that's, but actually that'll be the next talk that I'm dying to hear is, is about what happens when you start thinking about the really big stuff. So it's a game changer. What is it that you rise up the cost? Sorry? It's, I, don't, I don't know enough about the economics of why things are expensive. Um, I, I think it's just there isn't a whole lot of demand. There's architects, medical, aerospace. Exactly. Complexity has absolutely nothing to do with it. And ironically, complexity usually makes it cheaper because you're subtracting material to make it more complex. There's a formula that when you send a part, and if anyone wants to send a part, contact me and I'll walk you through the process to, to get a, a part printed by uh, some of the bigger houses and what you have. But um, they all have a formula, and it's the overall volume of the product, how much material it uses. Then there's the build volume, how much, area, how much volume it contains. And then there's the Z height. So, if you're, going to, if you're going to build this microphone in this orientation, it's going to cost five times as much as if you build it in this orientation because Z height is that. Other than that, you're paying by the volume. And if you're designing something that's like a big empty square box, you're going to pay for a lot of volume even though your material size is very low. So it's a really complex formula. None of the companies will let you know their formula. So you just bid them out against each other. It's as good as it's going to get. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In certain environments, I can see an advantage, say, in space if you want to print tools in the space station. Um, then it would be great to have 3D printed. It would also be great to have, in the same machine, something that takes old parts and melts them down and reuses that material. Is there any work on that? Not that one machine can do that. There's a book called The Diamond Age by Neil Stevenson that's just really cool, but that's fiction. Um, there are some machines that are using fully recycled materials. All the, most of the ma machines will recycle some of the material at least, but in general there is not that closed loop throw it in the hopper, pull out a new part yet. I mean, that's, everybody's like talking about that, but it doesn't exist yet. There's actually a prototype device that does that called DishBot. It's part of the counterintelligence program at the MIT Media Lab. I believe it was made in 2005 or something by a guy named Leonardo Bonanni. If you look it up, there's tons of great videos. It's, it's totally a prototype. I love that. That's so cool. It makes plates and cups. <laughs> right on. Who needs a dishwasher? Uh -huh. Would you be able to print food? There are food printers all over the, yeah, there are a number of those. Um, there, there's a, some examples you'll find of like printed pretzels. Uh, there's the cupcake maker that I think MakerBot has some variation that does that. There's a, uh, if anyone ever goes to Chicago, there's a, a restaurant called Moto, M-O-T-O, and it's a, you've been there? 
Yeah, it's supposed to be really cool. They, they print on the tortillas and you, you eat the menu and it's, but they're doing a lot of really experimental stuff with re repurposed HP plotters and really cool stuff. Um, yeah, 3D printing food is, is not far off. How many variants of materials can you use in these printers? Um, well, each printer has a certain range that it can do. So the polyamide base printers like this one can print polyamides, the metals can do metals. Um, there are maybe 12 metals, maybe 50 plus polymers, uh, 20 plus elastomers, I'll say. Um, you know, there are hundreds of materials. Yeah. And, so, but it, does everything need to be printed in a singular material, or can you mix yeah. it? In? You can't mix and match. Yeah, you can't mix and match. The closest thing is the the uh, object. I think it's object Eden printer that that gets you there. So but you can do with salt. right. Yep. <laughs> or yeah, tomatoes with mozzarella. Yeah, not yet. When that day happens, we'll all be very excited and fat. Mm -hmm. What else can we expect in the coming decade? Um, what my company is going to roll out pretty soon, which is going to be really cool. <laughs> can't, so we're in stealth. I can't say a thing about it. It's really cool, though. You're just going to, holy shit. But I can't say anything about it. So that. Aside from that, um, I think uh, Professor Koshnevis will have some really cool stuff. Um, we're going to expect, I think we can expect the cost to go down, the part turnaround time to go up. Um, the thing that I, I told all my students is the day that we start seeing these show up at Kinko's, which I've given a year before we'll start seeing them at Kinko's, that's when things get exciting because we start really democratizing fabrication and we start really inviting everyone to play. Um, we already have open source 3D software uh, called Blender 3D and SketchUp and those are, those are decent for free and you can create fantastic 3D models and get them printed. Um, so we can expect a lot of that. I think the medical world's gonna be the big one. Disability's huge. Um, Already now, oh, here, here are a couple of little just fun nuggets that you can entertain your friends with at the next cocktail party. Um, so the printing, the machines, like this is a part out of an EOS P730 machine. It's a wiring harness. What's cool about it is they printed this on their machine. So, you know, hinge and everything. This was all, this came out of their machine just like it is. You know, they can print the hinges all together. Um, so that... That's an example of the machine printing itself. The, the machines print about 40% of their own machines on them. So, I mean, that's kind of Terminator, you know, it's like, when, does it, when do they decide that you're extraneous? You know, and, you know, who needs humans anymore? That kind of thing. Um, this is the first step in that direction, which is, is kind of cool. The Boeing Dreamliner has something like 80 parts that are made this way on it. They're 3D printed. The um, uh, Joint Strike Fighter has an undisclosed number, but apparently a lot. The, um, the European uh, uh, last whatever Airbus that came out, that has a lot of metal parts in it, you know, 3, 3D printed metal parts. Apparently aircraft carriers have these on them, so they print parts on demand, um, that kind of thing. We're, we are seeing some really crazy weird advances happening there. Um, but I think, I suspect kind of metal and custom stuff for the body is gonna be the really the exciting growth area. And um, then uh, Professor Kushnevis will talk about housing and that's, that'll be cool too. Maybe one last question. Yeah. Um, okay. Basically, I don't know if you know, but um, more, right. you said that, I don't know, it's a question. You said that uh, you're not familiar with how much uh, these things cost. I assume the technology price will drop, but the material price will stay pretty much the same because they're already cheap. So, for instance, if you want to do one kilo of something, how much does it cost? It's, um, it depends. The, yeah, it depends on the, the, yeah, the reason they can't do gold is they can print gold, no problem. But it's, um, it would be $240,000 to, to take this titanium out and fill it with gold. And then you'd have to have like security guarding your fabrication facility. So they don't print gold. You know, it's a weird one. Um, polyamide, this stuff is three bucks a cubic inch. Decently cheap. Um, the, this stuff that I used for this part was actually about nine bucks a cubic inch. It just, it's all over the place. Um, it's, it's anyone's guess. Every material has a different uh, yeah, volume, cost volume. Like the prices of the material will drop, right? Because this, this is already... They might. Yeah, they, they might. They're, a company called Ivonic is kind of, kind of the stranglehold on that in the world. Um, and they can raise or lower it on demand. There are a lot of new com competitive companies that are coming out with their own cocktails and things like that. Um, there are some cheap materials coming out now that are really competitive with the really expensive stuff. So we're just seeing it's this... It's kind of a cowboy town in the market right now, so all across the board. Okay. Thank you.